uh, I have a lot of very detailed information that I would love to share with you as part of the Internet Archive uh, use case that I'll um, get into in a few minutes. And I didn't want to misrepresent any of the specific uh, details, and I think I got this a little too close to my face there. Um, before I begin, I wanted to thank uh, one of my colleagues in the Internet Archive operations team, a gentleman named Ralph Mullen, who was able to compile the statistics associated with the data I'm going to share with you. We thought it was important to provide a perspective from practitioners sort of rolling up our sleeves in the field trying to deal with some of the challenges associated with data at scale and, and um, ongoing power consumption. So I think amongst cultural heritage organizations, motivations for green digital preservation and sustainability often never emerge or are driven by a wide range of factors distinct to an institution's mission, mandate, operating budget, the amount of control they might have over IT decisions, and the overall social political climate in which that organization operates. Maybe it doesn't. I'm out of range, sorry. Stand. Alright. As David's already highlighted, uh, green digital preservation usually isn't at the top of the list of issues facing a library, archive, or museum. Keeping pace with the rate of digital data ingest and its creation can be daunting enough. Motivations to preserve in a sustainable way vary depending upon where you are in the globe, how long you've been ingesting more digital content and digitizing physical assets, how rapidly your digital collections are growing, and the range of preservation and access services uh, you support to those collections. There are limits to what any institution can achieve alone or even in partnership with other like-minded institutions. But eventually, every organization or program faces a challenge that could include a green choice as a solution. Many of us in this community tend to be attracted to the promise of preserving more content and making more data accessible for the same investment of resource. Reducing overall power consumption is not yet a requirement we face. Doing more with the same amount of power, however, remains a seductive option. Of course, for some organizations, uh, the reputation as an environmentally responsible institution can also be a driver, especially if you're investing tens of millions of dollars in green stacks. It makes complete sense to attempt to do the same with virtual collections wherever and whenever feasible. For centuries now, memory institutions and cultures have engaged in preservation of their sacred texts and objects using what we now term green techniques. For example, hiding them in mountain caves or salt mines, placing them into berms, that seem to disappear at the side of a hill. In some corners of the globe, modern digital stewards are doing the same thing today. And I want to use an example of our colleagues at the National Library of Norway, who opened a mountain vault about 10 years ago now. They uh, had in mind both physical and digital collections when they created the vault and built isolated server rooms deep within the mountain to take advantage of naturally cool conditions and simply ven added ventilation to remove the heat produced by spinning drives. They've since had to tackle some issues with humidity, but none of those have um, impacted their ongoing operations. They also maintain uh, one copy of all their data on a spinning drive today, and two copies on tape. One copy of tape is actually based in Moirana, the other is in Oslo. In the event of data loss locally, they can restore content within minutes. Um, and the Oslo copy is really uh, serving the purpose of disaster recovery in the event of a total catastrophe in uh, Moirana itself. Um, they're also considering putting an additional replica outside their national borders. Now this is a really robust example of a, a memory institution that's been able to lower their long-term cost of data and still provide a significant level of access. And they have uh, well over four petabytes of data now sort of assembled within this um, infrastructure. But in general, that is, is not uh, the case. You're going to find a trade-off between sort of lowering your costs and being able to con continue to sustain your access, um, or you're going to have some impact in the amount of time it takes. Um, and many of us are using techniques to try to address this, like those listed on this slide, um, but they're, uh, they're trade-offs, no matter how you them. Now there's also much we can learn from other sectors. 
um, you know, whether we're talking about cloud computing providers, local governments, businesses, higher ed, and high tech for profit and not for profits. Um, many of these organizations are ex uh, supporting extensive digital collections and service operations. And although individual case studies vary, the enhancements that many of those organizations have been able to implement um, are still applicable to cultural heritage, even though they're often optimized for real-time access versus long-term storage and access. Things like innovative physical data center facility designs and polling systems, relocation of data to different geographies, increases in storage densities and improved airflows, increased average temperatures in server rooms sometimes in excess of 85 degrees. Some examples of commercial efforts that you might want to uh, take a look at that have uh, emerged in the last three to five years are Yahoo's Chicken Coop uh, data center model up in New York State, Google's data center in Havina, uh, Finland, or some of the evaporative cooling techniques deployed in Facebook, uh, Google, and Yahoo. Now, a consortium of, in of interested parties called the Green Grid um, not unlike the NDSA, actually, in structure, um, has been defining a body of standard metrics by which to measure usage and efficiencies in data centers, including things like power usage efficiency, server compute efficiency, data center compute efficiencies. Now, PUE is the only metric I'm going to speak to in any detail today from the, 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 the body of those. Um, and it's defined as the total energy needed to operate a facility divided by the energy needed to operate the IT within the facility. Now the industry average PUE in 2008 was about 1.5 to 2, meaning for every 100 kilowatts of compute power, 50 to 100 kilowatts of cooling power were also needed to support those operations. Now, often organizations who embark on uh, efforts to try to reduce their PUE are initially motivated by what it can mean for a reduction in, in operational expenditures. Um, meaning you know, maybe an increase in overall capacity for the same cost, or the operation of services at a fraction of the cost relative to another equivalent facility um, due to certain methods implemented. Um, these are the very same uh, motivations that drove the Internet Archive in recent years to make modifications to our data center operations in San Francisco. So I'm going to drill into those now. For those of you not familiar with IA, um, we're a digital library established in 1996 we're a not-for-profit that maintains over 14 petabytes of publicly accessible data, digital content, um, including ebooks, digitized text, films, video, audio, uh, software, uh, internet content, television news. Um, I'm going to offer some limited insights into what making green choices might look like for an organization on a relatively small budget and with limited staff. Uh, but keep in mind, we tend to be a little bit wacky. Um, some of the things that we choose to do, others might go, oh my gosh. Um, so uh, think of this as sort of uh, inspiration and uh, directional opportunities to experiment with something different. So we began under pressure to lower our operational expenditures um, by reducing our power consumption. Um, this came as a mandate in 2010 uh, from our founder, Mr. Kale. Um, we had recently moved into uh, the building that you saw uh, pictured recently, and um, we really wanted to operate uh, differently and in a more sustainable fashion. So the key metrics we identified to drive sort of evaluation of our processes was certainly improving our PUE as defined by the green grid and broader tech communities, and reducing kilowatts per petabyte required to support storage and access services to our digital collections. We've already talked about PUE, um, but I want to spend a quick minute on kilowatts per petabyte. Uh, now, operation costs have been the second highest in our budget behind human resources for our entire history. The kilowatt per petabyte metric is a good way for us to measure our needs and to estimate budget implications for operational choices we are making at any given point in time. So it's a metric we've tracked since 2004, so we have a little bit of um, historic context that we can bring. Now, I'm going to spend just a minute going back in time and giving you a little bit of context um, in order to uh, understand why we made some of the modifications that we did um, uh, as of 2010. Now, we don't have any data prior to 2004 other than CapEx that we really tracked in an operational layer. So we're going to start our history in 2004, even though our operations go back to 96. 
So from 2004 to 2010, we rented traditional air-conditioned data center facilities, much like what many of you might be familiar with. Um, we replicated data locally and globally to foster distributed preservation, and we designed and built our own hardware uh, to reduce power consumption and minimize the risk of data loss, biasing longevity over compute capacity. In fact, we cooled drives to the processors and individual nodes. Now, the upsides to this approach was PUE fell within industry averages, uh, as best as we could estimate, um, at around 1.8 in 2010. This was largely due to increases in storage density and um, some of the increase in component quality without increases in requirements for kilowatts to operate individual components um, that occurred during this same time frame. Uh, in fact, over two to three generations of hardware migration, we were able to reduce from 117 kilowatts per petabyte down to 39 kilowatts per petabyte, not including cooling. And that's all for the same stable upfront investment of about 120K USD per rack. Now the downsides is uh, due to the rental arrangements, we had no real control over power consumption in aggregate uh, and optimization of that, nor cooling and airflow um, in our individual facilities. And by 2010, we'd done everything we could do to optimize hardware, now we needed to try something different. In 2008, toward the end of the, this phase of our operations, we actually partnered with Sun Microsystems, this was pre-Oracle days, and deployed one of the first generation of modular data centers at one of their Santa Clara facilities. The promise um, of this was that it would be cheaper and faster to build out than a traditional data center, and it was. Um, but PUE for the installation was estimated to be at the high end of the range of the industry averages at the time, at about two. Um, we estimated the kilowatt per petabyte requirements at 67 kilowatts per petabyte, um, and subsequent generations of containers had better ratios um, due to better to higher density and hence lower kilowatt per petabyte uh, factors. Cooling was water-based, though, so when it came time for us to relocate the container um, under a request by Oracle um, from Santa Clara to Richmond, California, um, we were unable to, to do so. Um, we actually joked internally that if only we were operating a swimming pool, then we could make a green cost justification that we heat the pool and cool the data center, um, but alas, we don't operate a swimming pool. Um, in 2005, we also began experimentation with cloud computing on uh, Amazon Web Services to facilitate data mining and indexing of web objects at significant scale. Um, we've retained, on average, about 30 terabytes of data um, over a seven-year period in S3 with no data loss or corruption. Um, we could not afford at the time, because we weren't able to make the data public, uh, to sustain the model at petabyte scale, um, but the cloud continues to uh, represent on-demand resources for us for hosting research data sets and for supporting large-scale computational needs without investment in additional infrastructure. Um, our largest jobs tend to run for about 24 hours on thousands of nodes at a time, um, but that's become uh, a small job on, on Amazon, if you can believe it. So the next set of experiments really came to fruition, as I mentioned, in 2010 when we moved into our Funston Avenue facility. Now that's a historic Christian Science Church um, constructed in the 1890s in the inner Richmond district of San Francisco, which is pretty foggy most of the time. Um, and then for the first time, we had complete control over our physical plant. Um, however, we were handed a, a set of rules that we had to operate under um, in order to modify um, our facilities. Um, specifically, uh, we were to uh, make a concerted effort to reduce power consumption by measuring actual usage, <laughs> analyzing and evolving solutions, um, not by guessing, uh, which sounds um, Simple, and of course, that's what you'd want to do, but um, there's always uh, a caveat um, when you try one of these things. Racks needed to coexist with humans. Um, we didn't want to hide them. Uh, we needed to um, make sure we weren't ruining uh, the historic space with ducts and AC plant. In fact, there was a mandate for no air conditioning whatsoever since we're two miles from the ocean with 49 makes per year of natural cooling. Um, we also uh, decided it was time to use commercially manufactured equipment. Uh, we should not continue to um, assemble our own hardware. We needed to focus on, on core missions. Um, and uh, we needed to make it as pretty as the Jedi library. Um, so on the hardware front, uh, we were able to acquire um, commercial off-the-shelf servers, although we did make some modifications to them. 
Um, we ended up uh, removing some server fans, slowing remaining fans, um, we dampened wall covers, and we ended up repurposing uh, heat to actually heat our, our building operations. Um, we're using uh, Supermicro on the manufacturing side and Kingstar uh, for assembly and local support. Um, in parallel, our, our, we were handed uh, the mandate across the Internet Archive to ensure that we were deduplicating all materials upon capture or creation prior to ingest into our catalog systems. Um, so there was a, a massive effort to deploy um, uh, an HBase implementation, for example, to ensure that um, we were uh, on for ongoing crawling. Everything was um, deduplicated in, in real time. In terms of um, the other mandates, we also looked historically, like should we go back into our existing data sets and deduplicate back through time? We determined that actually it was going to cost us more resource um, than uh, benefit, so we did not actually deduplicate uh, back. Uh, and anything written prior to 2010 is as it was originally written and, and contains a fair amount of uh, duplication in our collections. Now, we hit um, a series of pitfalls along the way. You probably can't read this, but when you uh, go to look at the slides later, um, you'll love this still work. It's absolutely hysterical. Um, our biggest issue was the power company. Um, there were smart meters deployed. They were um, collecting real-time data over a network, but uh, they'll be damned if they give us access to an API to our energy data. So we faced the problem of, well, how do we actually take measurements ourselves, and how do we afford to do that? Most of the available solutions were beyond our, our um, uh, budgets at the time. So uh, Ralph, uh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, a senior member of our ops team, actually built a whole data center real-time networked power meter for less than $500. Um, he plans to write up um, and open source the instructions for how he accomplished that so other institutions can do the same if you're interested. Once we'd stabilized uh, the physical infrastructure and collection data management policies, we turned our attention towards server efficiencies in terms of timing, energy use, to avoid peak utility windows, we also wanted to make general improvements to our pro productivity for server mode. Um, the image, which you can't really read on the left, uh, shows an example for monitors of our, our web crawl and uh, index merging operations. The first spike you see is a compute job. We were able to change routines to smooth out usage and avoid repeats of those intervals. The second spike is an incident of weather, specifically an increase in outdoor temperature. Sometimes we can increase natural airflow and reduce uh, temps as they rise. Uh, reduce temps internally as they rise externally, um, but about two to three days per year um, will get external temperatures in excess of 90 degrees, and usually they fall in a row, unfortunately. Um, and there's really nothing we can do in these circumstances, so um, it is actually our official policy that if we believe our equipment is at risk, we will actually shut it down. Um, and in this case, rain preservation trumps access. Now this is only one replica of our collections. So there may be another data center uh, within our network that might pick up um, publicly available access or you'll get the friendly message explaining that we're um, unavailable for a period of time. Now the other thing that we were, oh, sorry, the, the one on the right is actually um, showing a, a series of hygiene jobs. So I'm gonna, um, I only have two more slides, so I'm gonna go a little faster. Um, in terms of some of the other things we were able to put in place was more sophisticated automation to manage environmental change. Um, we combine software with network devices that, to measure and monitor and make data-driven adjustments both virtually and physically. And this is an example. Um, for example, we can look at you know, if there's temperature and whether or not a fan is actually operating, then power up an alternate fan um, and alert the humans. You know, the, that type of logic is, is now widely uh, distributed within our, our infrastructure. Now, the good news is um, we've seen pretty substantial success uh, over the past three years. Um, PUE is usually less than one. Heat get, gets reused within the building. Um, not all days do we attain this level, but we do so. Uh, we violate this at our own discretion. Uh, the kilowatt per petabyte metric has dropped from 8.5 to 2.8 um, kilowatts per petabyte. Uh, you can add about a kilowatt uh, if we're running compute VMs. And uh, we do so on most nodes, but not all. We're not going to expect many additional efficiencies in hardware optimization. Um, we're really looking at, at other ways of greening in the future. Our data centers' uh, operations are, are quiet. Um, in fact, we hear more complaints about the, the loud human nearby or the fact that there's no place to make a phone call um, than we ever do about our, our servers. Um, and I wanted to leave you with one more wacky thought. So uh, one of the members of uh, 
our ops team sent me um, a reference uh, to this um, project. More as a joke than anything, but uh, um, I thought it was kind of a fun way to, to close out uh, this talk. Uh, if you haven't heard about Server Sky, it's a concept around putting data centers in space and sort of cool microcosms. Um, proposed by a guy named Keith Lastrum up in Oregon. And, you know, especially in context of the raging debate about putting solar panels in the, in the desert, um, it seems uh, uh, relevant that we might avoid the debate altogether by just launching 